Good, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever in the world you are. My name is Maurizio Benazzo. My name is Zaya Benazzo. We are here from the unceded territory of South Pomo and coastal Miwok, now called uh, Sebastopol, California. And I'm looking that we might be reaching the limit of this meeting. So if you have friends that are trying to connect, we'll be live streaming it also on YouTube. And we'll be sharing in a moment link to the YouTube. So you can send people, friends there. Um, so... Um, well... I just... To, no words can speak to the immense suffering, devastation, and injustice that we are witnessing on a daily basis as the relentless assault on Gaza is happening and intensifying and the horrendous humanitarian crisis. Many of us are experiencing anger, rage, grief, um, despair, and many of us are haunted by images of unspeakable suffering and howling grief. So I think this is a little bit the background as I would imagine for many of us for this conversation. And we have invited Gabor and Daniel to, to tackle the, the difficult question, how to stay in conversation, how to stay in relationship, as uh, we're facing those um, completely uh, different narratives and realities. Um, yeah, you... and as a brief introduction, Dr. Mate is an expert in trauma addiction and the connection between stress and illness. And Daniel Mate is an award-winning theater songwriter and co-author with Gabor of the book, The Myth of Normal, Trauma, Illness, and Healing in a Toxin Culture. As a support, we also have with us uh, Betsy Politin, an internationally recognized breathing movement specialist and best-selling author of uh, whose last book is named Hugh Manual. So thank you all of you for being here. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you, everyone. And just to give you a little bit of a structure, we'll start with an introduction from Gabor and Daniel. We'll ask a couple of questions and then open the conversation to you to bring your own questions. And the way we invite you to send your question is by typing it first in the Q&A box and then raising your hand if you want to ask your question live. Otherwise, uh, we can read it on your behalf if we don't see your hand raised. So please type your question first. In the Q&A? Yes. And raise your hand. Not like this, but in the bar at the bottom of Zoom, which I know you all know by now. And the chat will be closed during the conversation. Let's start. So Gabor, uh, welcome and... Um, if you have any introduction for, for the conversation. Sure, thank you. So um, welcome everyone. There's a heaviness in the world these days. Um, as I mentioned the word grief, the word grief itself comes from the Latin word for heaviness. And um, it almost doesn't matter which side of the fence you're on, if you will, from your point of view, from your perspective, the heaviness is felt by everyone. <clears throat> it's also felt by a lot of people who are not um, either necessarily Jewish or pro or anti-Zionist or pro-Palestinian, and just the heaviness in the world about what's going on. People say what is my expertise to talk about this? What is What gives me special authority to address this issue? The answer is nothing. Nothing gives me special authority. Nothing has ever given me special authority to talk about anything. Um, people say, well, you're a trauma expert and ADHD addiction. What are you talking about this issue for? And, you know, there's a validity to that argument. 
the fact that I'm Jewish doesn't give me any special authority. The fact that I'm personally an infant survivor of the Holocaust, that gives me no special authority because that means lots of people who are Jews and survivors who don't agree with me at all. The fact that I'm a former Zionist doesn't give me any special authority, special authority either because there are lots of former Zionists who are still Zionists. The only thing I can say on my own behalf, at least not on my own behalf, but on behalf of the perspectives that I put forward, is being Jewish, being a survivor, and being a former Zionist, I fully understand the perspectives that come from those experiences. I used to believe in them. I'm talking about the mainstream perspective. I used to be able to articulate it. I could do so in my sleep even now. So if I no longer subscribe to those perspectives, it's because I've been through a process of transformation. And that has been true for all my all my work. I was raised in the and and trained in the mainstream medical ideology about health or illness, about addiction, about mental health, and so on. If I've come to my own particular perspective on all of these issues, it's because I've examined them for myself and I found the mainstream perspective to be lacking, to be narrow, to be not congruent with all the evidence. None of that gives me special authority. It just means that I have a point of view that's based on my own investigation of the phenomena, whether it's medical or political or whatever it is. And that's all I can say on my behalf right now, is that I've looked at it from every angle, and I've come to believe what I believe. And it's for you to decide, not based on any authority on my part, but simply on, does it make sense to you? Does it congruent with your experience? And you can ask yourself, have you looked at all the evidence? Have you looked at all sides of the question? Or have you accepted uncritically or naively one particular view without even really particularly examining the other? That's all we can ask of ourselves. is such an emotional subject. There are no experts on this subject. I mean, there are academic experts, but for all their academic credentials, that doesn't mean that they're right. Because underneath the academic perspective and all the intellectual points of view and facts and history that we put forward, there's a worldview, there's an emotional stance. And on this issue, Whatever you say intellectually or factually or historically is very much determined by your emotional stance. So you can have any number of PhDs, multiple PhDs, completely disagreeing because the emotional stance that they're coming from has them look at it in completely different ways. And that's the dilemma, is how to be cross, how to be bridge that gap of perspective. That's the challenge. I'll stop there. Daniel, you want to say, like to, bring like to hear Daniel, here to hear me. your... Yeah. Hi, Daniel. Okay. Hello. Hi, everyone. Um. So I might be less familiar to many of you than the, the previous speaker. Um, <clears throat> I'm Gabor's son, Daniel. And, um, you know, I'm here at this one. I wasn't at the previous ones. So I've been wondering, what am I doing here? Which is a thematic, a, a thematically resonant question in my life. I often wonder what the hell I'm doing somewhere or here in general. And I've been trying to answer that for myself. Like, what can I bring to this conversation? Um, and what am I 
in some ways hoping to get from it too, but certainly what am I hoping to provide? You know, in a way, the title of this is a bit misleading or could be a bit misleading. In my other work with Gabor, my dad, we do a workshop called Hello Again, a fresh start for parents and their adult children, which is exactly what it sounds like. It's a workshop about bridging two different kinds of perspectives, the perspective of being a parent of an adult child and the perspective of being an adult child of a parent. And you have one of each, one of each, what am I, I'm, I'm in Paris right now. I'm starting to develop a strange accent. Um, maybe I'm just nervous. You have one of each in on stage, repre you know, representing the two different sides of the issue. So it's truth and advertising. Well, this event is called Navigating Different Co Difficult Conversations around the crisis in Gaza. And what you have is two mates who completely agree with each other. <laughs> and we're supposed to hear, you know, help you figure out how to navigate difficult conversations. Well, some of you are going to find that arrangement more enjoyable and uh, welcome than others, I would think. Because if really the goal is to learn how to navigate difficult conversations, it would be a bit more of a representative challenge to have, say, you know, one family member who sees things one way, one family member who totally disagrees, and then we will embody and hopefully exemplify how to navigate those difficult conversations. That's not what you have here. You have two people who are different and who have different approaches to this and who's, who are using their respective platforms in different ways and who have different styles. You may have already noticed that about me and him. But ultimately, our perspective on the issue you know, they pretty much align one to one. And I learned a lot of what I know about it, or at least I got my start from having him as my father and then going to the Zionist summer camp he sent me to and learning what the limitations of that were and all that. So this isn't going to be an event where you're going to get like both sides of the story. You're going to get kind of one side told two different ways. So just let's just be honest about that off the bat, right? So we have our expectation, and which means if you need to balance it out by going listening to a Zionist perspective, you better go do that because you're not going to get it here. So what could you be here for? Well, if you're someone who sees things the way we do, you might be here for emotional support, to have your pain seen and heard, to get support for how to speak to people in your life who see things very differently, who are either cheering on what Israel's doing or justifying it or ignoring it or being silent about it, which to you, if you have that perspective, is going to be very painful. But if you're someone who's coming at this from a place of already suspecting that these two mates are kind of off base on this thing, what could you be here for? And I really respect you for being here. And I really appreciate you for being here. Truly, that's not an easy thing to willingly and on purpose tune into something that's going to push your buttons and trigger you, and it will. Because as as my dad said, it's a, it's a triggering emotional issue. I'll just say this, and I've been noticing this in my Instagram uh, DMs. I get a lot of people writing to me. I can only respond to some of them. And... Many of them are coming at me from a perspective of how can you say the things you're saying? Now, some of them just come at me with vitriol and abuse. That's how they lead. That's what they lead with. That, and I just take it like, look, they're activated. They're upset. I'm not a gentle speaker about this on Instagram. I am not moderated or, I mean, I try to use humor and some lightness, but I can often be very, very sharp. And I'm going to try to not bring that side of my personality so much here tonight, except if I really think it's useful, because I want people to remain open and I want to remain open to people, but I can get very activated. But sometimes people come at me with a kind of strong, sharp energy. So I had a woman write to me the other day. I posted the video that my dad and Aaron and I did that's on YouTube that you might have seen. And her opening line was, bullshit, these three are self-hating Jews. And then I wrote back, I said, well, Thank you. I'm not sure how you intend this conversation to go, if that's how you're going to start it. And then she said, look, I'm a real big fan of your dad's. And she started, you know, being a lot more friendly or whatever. 
And then I said to her, well, okay, if, if, but that's just a strange way to speak to somebody, you know, to call me a self-hating Jew. But I could, but I could hear that behind that opening insult, which was a kind of bluster on her part, there was a desire for a kind of exchange, but I had to set some boundaries and say, you're going to have to clean that up with me and apologize to me first before I'm going to, you have to treat me with respect if you want me to treat you with respect. Other people come at me and I, they're very vulnerable and open that they're like, look, I'm a Zionist. I've always been a Zionist. My heart is hurting right now. I hate the way people are talking about Israel, this country that I love, this country where I have so many people that I love living there. And yet I know something is wrong, but I can't go all the way over to the other side where you are right now because I'm hearing people on your side saying things that just, just, just wring my heart out like a dish rag. And other things like that. And what I hear in those things is there's an implicit or an explicit request that I help them understand this perspective that I have in a way that it doesn't hurt so much to listen to, that it, they can at, at least open themselves to it enough to hear what it's saying. And what I take from that is that people sense that there may be something lacking in their own point of view, that if they could open their minds, as Gabor said, something might actually be able to crystallize and relax in them, even though it might be painful because we all have our echo chambers. And just like my dad, I've been in the other one. I went to Hebrew school, I went to a Zionist summer camp, I know those arguments inside out. Most Zionists I know have never been inside the echo chamber of Palestinian solidarity and all of the history and perspectives that that comes with. So if you're here to prove us wrong, or to argue with us, that's one possible way to be here, and that'll go how it'll go. If you're here to hear something new, that could be a good reason to be here. If you're here to find out how it is that two Jews could see things the way that we see things, even if you don't plan to change your mind one iota, except to expand it a bit, to see what might be rational about this point of view, what might be sensible about this point of view, what might be human about this point of view, and what might this point of view have to offer you, or even just to understand the people in your life, your kids, your friends who are saying to you, I can't, I can't talk to you right now given how you see this. So those are all possibilities for how to be here, and I'll leave it to each of you to engage, but the way you listen is gonna have a big impact on, on what you hear. So that's my opening overture. And again, thanks to everyone, no matter where you're coming from, for, um, for, for joining in this conversation with us. Thank, Thank you so Daniel. much, Daniel. And I'll just, and one technical thing, my battery might start to die at some point and my, my electrical adapter that lets me plug into European wall outlets is not working very well right now and so if my computer dies i may have to move around the room to some other place or even log back in on my phone um so i hope that's going to work out but i hope i can last long enough for that not to be an issue great yeah thank you gabor i was wondering if there is anything you want to share about your own learning in this almost five months of speaking about this issue and expressing your own truths. Um, anything you want to share about your own learning in this? Oh, wait, we're your, not hearing you. My learning has been about <clears throat> how careful I have to be to take care of my own emotion, internal emotional space. <clears throat> because as Daniel and I have both said, we can get triggered on this issue. And triggered means that emotions take over. Um, something explodes inside. And that harshens my voice. It limits my listening to somebody else. It makes me impatient with their perspective. And um, it really um, diminishes 
my capacity to be in contact with somebody else. So what I've learned mostly is the importance of taking care of the internal space <clears throat> and to understand that even if people are coming with the kind of hostility that Daniel mentioned, I mean, we've had so much stuff thrown at us uh, about being self-hating Jews and terrorist supporters and you know, all this kind of stuff, you know? But, but to understand that even somebody who speaks like that, they're just triggered. They're coming from pain. They're coming from confusion. And that necessity to stay open and compassionate and present to all perspectives is just so difficult especially when we look at what's happening out there. So that's been a learning for me, is just the essentiality of maintaining an internal peace, even in the face of this terrible suffering that we witness every day. Thank you, Gabor. Thank you, Gabor. Do you Before wanna... we start yeah, with the questions, I would like to bring Betsy in for a moment. Betsy, uh, if you can just guide us through something, resources to be grounded and centered in this conversation. Yes, uh, Gabor just mentioned uh, taking care of the internal space. So when Gabor first spoke, he mentioned the heaviness and the grief. And when Daniel spoke, he mentioned the possibility of the expansion of a new perspective. So let's see how we can put those together for ourselves. So start by feeling whatever's under you, whatever connects you to the ground, the earth. Perhaps the bottoms of your feet, the hips on the chair. And by the way, you don't have to change your position or anything. Wherever you are, something is under you. Or your back, touching the back of the chair or pillow. Maybe your arms resting on your table or your lap. Or you're lying down, your head. So no need to do anything about what you find. No fixing, no adjusting, or even manipulating. Because we're not getting rid of anything and we're not trying to change anything. We're bringing awareness to what's there. But do allow change if it occurs from inside. So your attention is where you meet what's under you. It's your support from the planet, your contact with the planet that we all get. So we use this heaviness that we mentioned, but in the contact, there's a possibility of support and expansion. And as you become aware of your support, notice any changes, perhaps your breath. Yeah. And we all live on the same planet. Take that in. So let's gather supported on our planet and breathing. Thank you. Thank you, Betsy. Thank you, Betsy. Thank you, Betsy. There's one comment in the chat that I'd like to address right away, if I may, because I think it's important. Yeah. And it's from Aliza, uh, who writes that uh, I'm a trauma therapist treating victims in Southern Israel following October the 7th. I hope we can speak to all of those who are suffering. Well, I think that's very important. 
um, I don't think um, there's any intention here to, this is hard to say, because historically, and um, in terms of the current situation, if you look at numbers and degrees of death, destruction, and suffering, there's no equality here, absolutely none. But in terms of subjective suffering of people who've been hurt, of people who've been unfairly hurt, of people who've been victimized, and whose families have been devastated on a subjective level, there's no contest here between two levels of suffering. Everybody suffers, and there's suffering on both sides. And there's no attempt or intention on our part to um, diminish, deny, um, or denigrate in any way the suffering on either side. Our attempt is to understand the sources of that suffering on both sides and to find some ways of moving forward. But yeah, we do have to acknowledge that people on both sides have suffered. Okay, that's all I was going to say. And Zaya Muitsi, or whatever questions you want to bring up, please do. Tara, let's bring also Daniel and Gabor will start by reading one question and then you both can answer however you feel. So this is the question. What is the most effective way to break to break through to our Jewish Zionist friends to help them question the information they have been taught all their lives about the vision of the Israeli state? Can I oh. take a first crack at that one? Go ahead, Daniel. Yeah. Don't try. Right. Because you're operating from a working theory that is lost before you even begin. So when I say working theory, that's sort of a core concept of the work that I do. My modality is called mental chiropractic. I help people get unstuck. It's not trauma healing per se, although the way that trauma gets us in the present is that it gets us stuck in certain mindsets and strategies and things that don't work. We keep doing the things that don't work over and over again, and we can't help it, right? Well, one way of being stuck is to try to get through something that can't be gotten through, at least not in the present moment. And the working theory is that you have to get through to them. And that that's how change is going to happen, is that if you say the right thing, if you turn the right key, if there's some strategy, some form... Look, if that was true, my dad and I would not be sleeping. We would be, you know, on a phone bank, calling every Zionist in the world, saying the magic words, waking them up out of the delusions we want them to wake up out of, and having a lot of success, and... Eventually, we'd reach a critical mass and, uh, you know, things would go the way we wanted to go, which is to say the end of the occupation, the end of the siege, uh, ceasefire, all of that. There is no formula. So how do things happen? Because I'm not saying give up all hope or keep your eye off the ball or anything like that. Well, there's this great Leonard Cohen lyric, which, of course, has turned into a Fridge mag a fridge a fridge magnet worthy cliche, but it's very, very true and beautiful and powerful, which is, you know, uh, ring the bells that still can ring. Forget your perfect offering. There is a crack, a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. Now, again, we're operating from the premise, from the theory that we know where the light is, which is to some of you may sound like a very arrogant and cocky thing to say. That's just where we're coming from. Not that we're 100% right about everything, but that our perspective, which just to, just to name it, would be seeing Palestinians as our full human brothers and sisters and sons and daughters, understanding this history to be one of dispossession and oppression, such uh, of a kind that us Jews intimately know, except in this case, the roles have been slightly changed, but it's a familiar script that universal human principles are more dear to us than tribal concerns and national and certainly than nationalist allegiances to which we have no allegiances because we get based on Jewish history we're very skeptical of such allegiances all kinds of stuff obviously we think that that's where the light is right we think that that is a perspective that is more expansive than one that is tribal nationalistic all those things so you may not agree with that 
but that's where we're coming from. If we're right, then how does the light get in? Where are the cracks for someone who is still cathected, cathected? Is that the word? Still attached yeah. to to a perspective that has them clinging to a nationalist project that is fraying at the seams, that is flailing around, that is acting lunatic right now. The whole world can see it. Where might the crack be for someone who, for whom Zionism has been an answer to a very deep question? Who am I? Who are we as a people? Where can we be safe? That's a, Those are very powerful adhesives that would keep someone glued to a perspective. So the first thing you need to do is if you're interested in their freedom, if you're interested in their expansion and their liberation, if, they, if your intention for them, your prayer for them is that they should release their heart from all the shackles that keep it tied to a losing ideology, what I sometimes call a suicidal death cult, but that's a, a pretty extreme way of putting it. Well, then you need to understand why are they holding on to those shackles in the first place what just like with any addiction as the work of a certain dr Maté lets us know what not what's wrong with the addiction what's right with it what does it do for the person well zionism's done a lot for a lot of jewish people and having gone to a zionist summer camp i can feel it inside i can still feel the warmth and, and community of 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 the, the zionist dream of jews finally liberated in this warm beautiful Mediterranean place away from the shtetls and away from the, you know, the, the, the jackboots and away from the Cossacks and away from all the suffering. Finally, we're free. Finally, we're sovereign. Finally, we're together. The belonging. Zionism, you know, Hitler had his final solution to the Jewish question. Zionism is another solution to a assumed Jewish question, which is, what, what is the world supposed to do with these people who don't belong anywhere? Well, Zionism's solution is let's belong there, except let's not really pay too much attention to who we had to unbelong in order to make it happen. So in other words, your Zionist friends that you are dreaming of shaking loose from their shackles or getting through to, they're holding on to something for dear life and for very good reason because they don't know who they would be without it. Now, their education didn't allow them to imagine who they would be without it because just like all education systems, and this is not a Jewish thing, this is not a Zionist thing, this is just how education systems, especially inside nationalist frameworks, work. You convince people that without this perspective, they'd be nothing and they'd be lost. So you can have some compassion for that. And then you just look for where are the cracks? Where might this person be shaky on this? Where might that sense of security be failing them? What questions might they have? What you know? And if you can be alert, alert and attuned to that, then you're tuning into not where you can, where can you get through to them, but where might they, in a sense, be opening to you without them even realizing it. That's what I'm finding to be a a more energy efficient and less crazy making approach and i think a more effective one but it's not guaranteed well i would simply say listen to them listen to these people <clears throat> reflect their perspective in a way that they know that you got it <clears throat> that you understand where they're coming from and then ask them are you open to a different way of looking at it if the answer is yes then go ahead if there's answers, no, don't even try. I keep quoting this expression, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. The bad news is you can't even lead the horse to water. So listen, acknowledge, as Daniel said, the value of that perspective in their lives. You can ask, is there an opening? If there isn't, don't push it. All you're going to get is resistance. Okay, we've answered that. And well, and, and one last thing. Don't fall into the trap of thinking there's some tone you should take or something you should say. Kind of anything goes. If they're willing to have a conversation with you, I'm finding sometimes I can be very gentle and patient and loving. And just my compassion takes that form. And sometimes my compassion takes a more impatient, like, 
come on, wake up already kind of form. It depends on who I'm with and who I'm talking to. There is no one way. You're going to get through to people best by being yourself. And if they meet all the conditions Gabor just laid out, which is they're open to a new perspective, at that point, letting them know where you're coming from and leading with your own heart, not just with your mind, not just with the facts, is a great way to reach people. Because people will not be convinced simply by reason alone. They'll be touched in their hearts and they'll feel a resonance in you where you you have something they want. You have a perspective that rounds out theirs. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll bring Sonia Chuni. Um, yeah, there you are. Hi. Hello. Hello. Um, so I'm calling from Germany and uh, I am Swiss, half Swiss, half uh, Tunisian. Actually, no, quite a Swiss and quite a Dutch, but anyway. Uh, I am calling you or asking you to help me find out how to speak to Germans about this topic because... Um, I have many friends who are great, amazing people, similar worldviews, but on this topic, I cannot get through to them. Yeah. Germany, of all the countries in the world, is the most difficult place to have this conversation. The, um, the persecution and prosecution of um, people who speak at all it, critically of Israeli policy or in favor of Palestinian rights is most pronounced in Germany of all the countries in Europe. Mm. And uh, a third of the I, I saw an article recently in the Guardian newspaper about this. A third of the people who've been threatened or silenced for speaking out in favor of some justice here have been Jews. Yes, indeed. So, 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 so Jews in Germany are accused of anti-Semitism if they speak on behalf of Palestinian rights. Yes. If you, right. if in Germany you um, talk about apartheid and you quote Israelis, rabbis and academics and, and, and journalists and intellectuals, and civil rights workers who talk about apartheid in Israel, in Germany, you can be canceled and will likely lose your job. Mm. Now, what's behind that? I think behind that, is, so, so sometimes it seems to me that the Germans haven't learned a thing. <laughs> yes, you know, but I have, I have, I have the impression that, that, I have sorry. the impression that, that uh, they, they want to learn, you know, they're yeah. engaged to learn, but something is is blocking them, guilt. Well, I, I, what well, it is. I, I think what's blocking them are two things, three things, actually. One is a tremendous guilt. And uh, I've talked to Germans who are in their 30s who feel guilty about the Holocaust. Yeah. So they carry this guilt. This, just as... Just as trauma can be collective and pain can be collective and multi-generational, it seems so can guilt be multi-generational. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing. The other thing is Germany is very much part of the Western alliance. Mm -hmm. So you don't get much truth in the Western press about what the West does in the in the rest of the world. This is not unique to Israel and Palestine. How much truth was there about, like Germany was one of the countries that invaded Afghanistan, mm -hmm. sent troops to Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. Germany largely supported the American invasion of Iraq, where half a million Iraqi civilians died. No, there, no. I, no. They, they were they did, very much they against it. Okay, well, I, I, I'm wrong on that one. Thank you. But by and large, but by and large, the, Afghanistan, which is crazy. Yeah. yeah. So, okay, more recently, then Germany is largely lined up with the American perspective, and yeah. and 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 what the Germans are hearing is a narrative that largely is 
whatever the Americans support, they support, mm. you know? Mm. So I don't know how to speak to them anymore. You know, just take the answer that Daniel I gave to the previous question. Yeah. To, you know, just the, yeah. take the same approach. But, you know, avoiding to talk about it is definitely not helping. You know, asking them if they're open yeah. to other perspective. Uh, I can see do that. Maybe that's that's a door, but I expect them to say, oh, yes, I'm open, but actually they aren't. So I would offer this. You know, it feels kind of like we're in Orwell's 1984, but we're not quite. You know, the Stasi isn't going to be at your door the minute you have a subversive conversation. You are no. allowed to say, hey, are you noticing something around, right? Is there a little something weird going on in this country right now around this? Yeah. Is it just me or like, are we not like, do you notice that people are really scared to talk about this? Do you notice the tension in the air when we even just bring this? Is there any other topic in the world where mm. we would feel this constrained? Does this remind us of any other time in German history? I mean, you actually almost have some fun with it. Not fun, but the, but the, 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 yeah, yeah. the, the levity right. that comes when you, when you just speak the unspoken, right? Cause it's so obvious it's so everywhere that it's nowhere but the minute someone has the guts to just point it out like huh this is a little weird here we are the country that um, taught the world the dangers of authoritarianism and um you know the, the 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 radical dangers of closing your eyes to obvious horrors what lesson did we learn exactly i don't know i don't know how they would react but i'll tell you if you get inside underneath their fear Mm. Man, it's tense in there. It's no fun to not be allowed to talk about something like this. It just sucks. And if yeah. someone said, "That's what stand-up comedians are for," in a good, <laughs> in, in a in a healthy society, they say, "Is anyone? Am I crazy? Am, what's what's the deal with censorship around Palestine?" You know, that's the Jerry yeah. Seinfeld I want. So what I'm saying is, if you can't change their minds on the content, maybe you mm -hmm. can poke a few little holes in the context, the invisible context that you're all stifling inside of put bring a little oxygen into the room open a window is anyone noticing this mm. see what happens okay. yeah actually i i had this um if i quickly can can Sorry, tell the we have so many questions i would like to move okay. on so we can give the voice to other people too i, I just i just gonna read, I, i'm just gonna read you one quote okay mm -hmm. uh, in response to this question <clears throat> i'm gonna read you a quote this is from a father to a son, okay? Mm -hmm. Keep your good heart. Become a person who lets himself be guided primarily by warmth and humanity. Learn to think and judge for yourself responsibly. Don't accept anything without criticism is absolutely true. Mm -hmm. The biggest mistake of my life was that I believed everything faithfully which came from the top, and I didn't dare to leave have a least bit of doubt about the truth of that which I was presented to me. Mm -hmm. In all your undertakings, don't just let your mind speak, but listen above all to the voice in your heart. Now, you might <laughs> quote that to your German friends. You know who said that? Mm -hmm. it, was yeah. Rudolf, it was Rudolf Hurst, the former commandant of Auschwitz, four days, yeah. before, four days before he was hung in Poland. No way. Yeah, in jail. You have, you have to send that to me, please, in the chat or somewhere. And if anyone hasn't seen the new movie, The Zone of Interest, about him and his family living on the outskirts of Auschwitz in their little mansion, mostly oblivious yeah. to what was going on, it's a must-see, especially at this moment. Anyway, yeah, we can say, I'll send that quote to Zaya Maurizio and you can, they can forward it. Thank you. And thank you. Sonia. So I'm switching computers now to the profile that says Daniel Mate 2, if you can find that somewhere in the mix. We'll do that. And that'll have battery. Okay, let's go on. Yes, I would like to bring Sally Munir. Sally Munir. And um, yeah, hi there. Hello. Hello again. Hi. Hi, Gabber. Hi, Daniel. Hi, everyone. I'm very, uh, very privileged to be here. Um, thank you for all the previous discussions and questions. So my question, so I don't waste anybody's time, is basically I come from Egypt. 
and I've been in the 2011 um, revolution part. I was an activist then, and I can, although the stories are very different, but the people are the same in the way they react to things when they're in the situation, you're in your own bubble, you're hearing your own media, and everyone is connected, and the social media now connects us in a way where uh, whatever you're following, you basically start following the same thing, following the same voice. And uh, my question is how, if you have any tips on dealing with the pressure of m supposedly my side, which obviously everybody thinks their side is the right side always, and I do stand on the Palestinian side as an Egyptian and as a person who was born in 1973, which is a significance in the way, you know, in, in the war between Egypt and Israel and the peace treaty and all that, uh, how do you do, deal with the pressure that your own people put on you on how much you participate in the social media and what kinds of things that I should be present with in social media? Having recovered finally from uh, being attacked by my own people after the Egyptian revolution for taking part in that. So dealing with that was hard enough. Um, recovering and looking at the situation now from outside, I live in Geneva, um, has given me so many perspectives to deal with how people will deal with the situation when they're in it, when they're inside the, the camp itself like people living in Cairo, who their livelihoods depend on certain beliefs and certain guidelines. Same thing here. People in Egypt or around the Middle East believe that we have to have videos on social media constantly about the situation in Gaza. Uh, whether they're lies or not, they don't care. Okay, so, so you're, you're basically saying how do, you, how do you buck the peer pressure of being on social media the way yeah. everyone else is and saying exactly yeah. what everyone else is saying and posting what everyone else is posting? Yeah, because friends and family yeah. believe that way, believe that, you know, we all follow the same route. Yeah. And I have a voice on social media and I'm a psychotherapist. And then the line, yeah. wh where do you draw the line? How do you deal with that pressure? Well, the question is, what's your intention? I mean, what what are, what are you on social media for? What is your platform for? Look, social media is high school. That's how it's designed. It's designed to feel like high school. It's designed to pressure you like high school. And we all have that part inside of us that's still susceptible to that. We want to be, look, what are the, what are the main units of currency of social media? Being liked and being followed. And then people talking about you. You know, that's not exactly very elevated adult um content you know emotionally it's hitting us right in the places where we want to belong and we want to be right and we want to be in with the right crowd if you're going to buck that you you have to just get out of that mentality and not accept the premise that that's what it's for so then the question is what is your platform for and what do you want to share about this now i can have my opinions about what i wish the famous people in my life would be sharing you know there's a very famous person in the healing world who put something out the other day that I just thought was woefully lacking and I think deserves criticism. But ultimately, everyone's going to use their platform the way they're going to use it. And, yeah. you know, no one can tell you, if you have a following, you built that following based on who you are, not based on your ability to parrot what other people do. And your discern that includes your discernment about what's true and what's false and what's a reliable source and what's not and what's worth sharing and what's not. People are just going to take out their frustration right now on you and their feeling of lack of agency. No one can control anything. And they want to be able to control something. So they're, if they can't lash out at Bibi or Netanyahu or Sisi, whoever, they're going to lash out laterally yeah. at the, with the biggest following who's in their life. I've seen it happening within the pro-Palestine movement. I've seen it happening within the Zionist movement. It's It's just human stuff exacerbated by these anti-social media that we've created. I would just invite you to lighten up about it and not take it too seriously because these people are just looking yeah. for some some leverage that they just don't have. I don't know what Gabo would say. All right. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Oh, yeah? Where's you? 
Yes. No. Advocate okay. Dad has nothing to say about that? Okay. We can move on. Thank you, Sally. Yes. Thank, thank you. Sally. Thank you very much. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. I would like to bring uh, Raf. Hold on. Where is Israel? Raf. Oi. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, so hold on. There you are. Yes. Rivka. Rivka. One of our one of our four matriarchs. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Hi, I'm calling from Jerusalem. I'm Hello, talking Jerusalem. to you from Jerusalem. And um I've loved both of you for many years. Um, I have followed Dr. Mate, your fa your esteemed father, and he has changed my life with his writing and his YouTubes and and I started following you and I love you. Mm. I love what you say, how you think, how you just you just have amazing energy. And you've you've been gifted by your, your parents, but your mother is also very beautiful. Um, I've listened to her. I I'm conflicted because as much as I love you, Dr. Mate, I'm Jewish and I'm suffering greatly because of what happened on October 7th and what has happened since then. And I wrote uh, something in the notes. Um, I wrote this question. I haven't heard you speak very much about the events of October 7th. I've heard you, I, I, I do, I do, uh, I do understand your, your, um, your thoughts about what's happening with the Palestinians and so forth, but I don't understand the fact that I haven't heard you speak about what Hamas, what these awful, I don't even want to call them human beings, did to innocent people. I know that you talked, you've talked about the 75 years prior. Your brother, Aaron Mate, has talked a lot about that in the Gray Zone News, and I follow him too, follow all of you. Um, but I don't see how that rationalizes what happened on October 7th and the fact that there are now 133 hostages, dead or alive, that well, they refuse to return to their homes. Mm -hmm. And um, and I, Golda Meir said that um, the difference between that other group of people who, who occupy the same land is that they don't seem to be crying for the torture and deaths of our children, but we cry for the deaths and torture of their children. No, am I wrong? Well, I no, no, it's no, not no, that no. you're wrong. She certainly said it. She, you know, she oh. said that. She said she it. Said, no, what she actually said was, we can forgive the Arabs for killing all children our children, but we can't forgive them for making us kill their children. That's what she said. Ah, uh, yes, I'm sorry. Thank you. Which I've always thought of as what Hitler's passive-aggressive Jewish wet nurse would have said, but anyway. No, no, Ray, don't, yeah. Daniel, Daniel, don't go there. Just listen, okay? okay. Anyway, I, I'm the child of a survivor of the Holocaust. My father's entire family was destroyed. And I yeah. know that Dr. Gabe, Dr. Mate is a, was a child survivor, is a child survivor. And as a genera second generation, um, I carry um, a lot of my father's pain. It will, it will probably never go away. And when I, when I watch every day what's going on on both sides, the, the suffering, um, the, the rationale for what the IDF is doing to Gaza is, of course, that Hamas is hiding in the tunnels and among and on the hospitals and in the homes of Gazan, innocent Gazan people and torturing, threatening them that if they don't join Hamas, they'll kill them and all that kind of stuff. But on both sides, people of people are dying. And I don't see an end to it. And I don't see a two state solution. I don't see how it's possible because. The goal of Hamas is to destroy every Jew, not just Jewish people, but anyone who doesn't believe in jihad, okay. Christian, Rivka, Buddhist. Rivka, Rivka, if we could, if we could narrow it to a question, yes. or okay. 
Because there's a lot to respond to. You're saying so much and it's all beautiful and it's all valid and it's all very important. I'm glad it's all being said in this space. But what would you like to know from us? Um, just could you could you speak about I know how you feel about Palestinians, but could you speak about how Jewish people feel and the rationale for what the IDF is doing in Gaza? I guess that's my question. All right. Thank you. All right. So first of thank all, you. thank you. First of all, thank you. I know it, it seems to you that that um, we have spoken a lot more about Palestinian suffering and not acknowledge the Jewish suffering. And oh. you and you seem uh, puzzled or troubled by that. Okay, so I hear you, and it's true. I've spoken a lot more about Palestinian suffering than I've talked about Jewish suffering. That's totally true. Okay. I have acknowledged the Jewish suffering on October the 7th. I've called it an atro atrocity. I said it was horrific. We've said that innocent people suffered. We've said all that uh, in my various talks. Um, at the same time, we've spent much more time talking about the background and the 75 years that preceded it. That's all true. Now, Number one, you don't know. I'm going to say to you, uh, Rivka, what you said about Hamas wanting to kill all the Jews in the world, how do you know? Have you read what they have to say about it? That's not what they say at all. That's just not what they say. They've never said that. That's a lie, okay, that you've been fed by your propaganda machine. I'm not here to speak on behalf of Hamas. I'm not a supporter or a lover of any fundamentalist religious organization or any organization that kills civilians. I'm not, not at all. But if we're going to speak uh, about the facts, let's talk about the facts. And what, the, what Hamas has said is they don't accept the right of the state of Israel as a state of Jews to dominate all of Palestine. And if you look at the charter of the Likud party, it says the same thing that there's no right for the Palestinians to have a state in from the river to the sea. So I'm saying, let's just be fair to both sides. That's the first point. The second point is, in terms of October the 7th, being somehow different and um, of a different category of inhumanity, well, it was bad enough, okay? Innocent people died and terrible things happened. Nobody questions that. But did you know that in 1948, many Arab women were raped by the Jewish militias? Were you ever taught that? I don't make that stuff up. That's been discovered by Israeli historians, Zionist historians. I can quote them to you. Did you know of the massacres that happened in 1947-48 of men, women, and children? I could go on the whole history, quoting nothing but Zionist and Jewish sources. You guys are not taught that over there. So when October the 7th happens, it just seems like these animals came out of nowhere for the pure hatred, and they tried to kill us all. Well, what I'm saying to you is I'm not going to go through the whole history, is, but there's a whole other narrative that you guys don't know. And the reason we keep doing talking about it is not because we want to favor Palestinians. We're saying that the Jewish suffering itself is created by a system that denies the right of the Palestinians to exist. And that's what creates the Jewish suffering as well. I don't want Jews to suffer. I don't want Palestinians to suffer. But I think... But from my perspective, for that suffering to end, there has to be an understanding of what's happened here all these years. October the 7th didn't come out of nowhere. And if you look at the, the, the psychiatric studies of Palestinian kids in 2005, 2007, already 20 years ago, 
the vast majority of her suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder before Hamas, okay? Yeah. Because of the occupation, because of the mass killings, because of the massacres that have been perpetrated on them for 75 years. And you guys don't know this over there. You just don't know it. Excuse me. May, may I, I respond? Rivka, I just want to, I just want to, before you respond, Rivka, I just want to say something as well, because I can see this is really hard for you. I can see you breathing very consciously, grounding yourself, taking this in. I want to admit to something here. There's truth in what you're saying. Even if I don't agree with some of the facts you articulated, I agree with God that there's a propaganda system that you've probably been subjected to. Everything I know about Israeli society tells me that's the case. That said, there has been a hardening of my heart against Israeli suffering. There has been. And I have to be honest about that. Mm. Because I get so identified with the ones that I consider, and I think it's just factually true to be at the the butt end of the traumatized, the, the, the trauma stick overall in this conflict in terms of who's done what to whom over the last hundred years and how many people have been displaced and killed and all that. And I get also so angry at the Zionists who miseducated me. And I get so angry at the world that we're, where so many of my fellow Jews are, you know, caught up in an ideology that I think is 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 destroying us. That, so, that something like October 7th happens. And there is a part of me that doesn't let myself even for a moment say, oh, my God, those poor people on those kibbutzim. Even though those people are of all the Israelis, they're the most my people. They were peace activists. Vivian Silver. A Canadian Jew murdered these young people who were dreaming of a better day, who were doing coexistence work, who were going to the Shtachim, going to the West Bank, to to you know to Sheikh Jarrah or wherever else, putting their bodies on the line. Did you see that incredible eulogy of, of Vivian's Palestinian friend, uh, who 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 worked you know who who were, was remembering her at her funeral at her memorial service? It's unthinkable. And even the people who were killed who might have had views I abhor. They had families. They were people. The terror of waking up one day and all of a sudden there's 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 violent people in your place, you know? And 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 they're and they're, and they're taking some people and they're killing some people and whatever happened. And as you know, if you follow the gray zone, there is a lot of question about what happened on that day, but that's not important right now. What I'm saying is there's a part of me that has shut down my empathy selectively at times and then i talk to real israelis and i remember that i just love israelis i always have and i've become better friends with some israelis as a result of october 7th and just feeling into the panic in that society where you are and the pain there and the bewilderment so I need to let myself melt sometimes off of my, you know, my righteous glacier of knowing who's right and who's wrong. But then I'll say this to you, Rivka, acknowledging that. When I look at the whole picture and I melt into a kind of compassion for everybody and feel into the pain of the Jewish people there, you know how I end up furious at? Ben Gvir, Shmotrik, Netanyahu, and the government that feeds on your pain and your trauma, that requires it for its lifeblood, that uses the suffering of your family and my family as a pretext to do what it's doing. I see an entire, you know, we talk about 130 hostages in the Hamas tunnels. I see however many Israeli Jews there are, 5 million, 7 million, I see 7 million hostages of a fanatical cult right now. And I know that you're all struggling, and I know that you all don't support Netanyahu. Many of you were out in the streets protesting him before October 7th. But there's a kind of emotional, cognitive, spiritual capture that the Jews of Israel are under right now. And my prayer is that they break free from that terrorist group. Now, I know that Hamas seems very scary. I know they did some horrible things. That's a different conversation. The facts of the matter are not as you've been taught them, as Gabor said. But I'm going to say to you, we owe you our sympathy. We owe you our compassion. We owe you our empathy. No matter who's right and who's wrong, of course your country endured an unendurable trauma on that day. And then when I let myself open into my heart about that, I still end up at man, oh man, oh man, do I want 
Israel to be free from Zionism? Do I want Palestine to be free from Israel? Do I want Jews to be free from this ideology that keeps them doubling down on not seeing another people fully as human being and not acknowledging and being accountable for what it took to create this state and this state of affairs? So that's as Thank far you. as I can go with integrity for myself. Can I, just one more thing. I know I know other people have, want to talk, but Dr. Dr. Mate, Ghazi Hamad, or whatever his name is, on Memory TV, they have the, the, their own TV station. He has, it's publicly spoken interview. In a two minute interview, he said, we will do October 7th over and over and over until yeah. we destroy every Jew, and get rid of Israel. Israel has okay. to be destroyed. He said but Rivka, it. It's, it's, Rivka, it's but, but Rivka, Rivka, here's my here's my answer to you. Okay. Yep. If you build the world's biggest prison camp, which is what David Cameron called Gaza, he's no he's no friend to the Palestinians. The former British UK Prime Minister called it the world's biggest open air prison, or the world's biggest concentration camp, which is what the Israeli sociologist Baruch Kimmerling called it, as well as Giora Island, who's still in power in the, in the IDF, called it a large concentration camp back in 2004. If you build an internment camp of that size and you police it the way Israel has, and you deprive its people of, and you brutalize them, you starve them, you do all the things which we don't have time to prove right now that Israel's done, but we easily could by directing you, as Gabor said, to Zionist and Israeli sources. You do not get to choose the nature of the prison gang that rises up to try and liberate its people. Uh, quite aside from the fact that Israel did choose Hamas back in the day and and support them, they did. But Never, Hamas, well, from, we're, from we're not going to we're not going to be able to we're not going to be able to have a back and forth. All I'm going to say is. If there is extremist rhetoric coming out of that, if out of the depths of hell, which is what Gaza is, if there are people who are so aggrieved and angry and even psychotic, driven, demented by their suffering, that they see the Jewish flag on that plane that's bombing their apartment building and killing their grandmother and and brutal and, and maiming their, their nephew and says, kill all the Jews, I'm not going to spend too much time getting up in arms about it. I'm going to ask, what are the damn conditions that created that psychosis for those people. I'm going to try and direct my attention to the powers that actually have some power. That's my perspective. Rivka, sorry, we have to move we on. We have to move on. You muted, so we can't hear you, but we need to move on. And but the only thing, the, the one thing I'm going to say more is, again, Rivka pointed to something true, and I and I have both acknowledged that, that we haven't talked as much about Jewish suffering. And in a certain sense, as Daniel acknowledged for himself and is true for me, my heart has been a bit hardened to even go there. And I'm, I'm not proud of that. I'm just saying that's what's happened. That's been in reaction. What you don't know, Rivka, is the context in which we're speaking. Because the context in which we're speaking is in North America, mm -hmm. where for 75 years, the Palestinian experience has been denied we're speaking in North America where people don't get reports about what happens in the occupied territories every day. The killings, the land deprivations, the house demolitions, the torture of people in jails, the thousands of Palestinian hostages that are in Israeli jails, children who are in jail because they posted something on social media, children who are tortured. You don't believe me? Read Haaretz. It's documented in there. Okay. Now, I sorry. All I'm saying is, I'm losing it again. Betsy, you're gonna have to come in here and calm me down, okay? But what I'm saying is, this thing called breathing you can do. Just breathe. We're speaking in a certain context. Yeah. We're trying to correct. We're trying to correct the historical record, and that's where we're coming from. Betsy, do you want to come in for a minute and just shut me up and calm me down? <laughs> Okay. Yes. Um, okay. Easy, quick. Take one hand. Yeah. <laughs> and put it on the back of your head so that half of your hand, two of your fingers are on the hard part of your head, the hard part, <laughs> and two fingers are on the soft part. And leave your hand here. And what we're doing is we're contacting 
for the reptilian brain, the survival brain, the fight or flight that is now activated for many. So use your own hand, your own breath, your own contact to what's under you, to the planet. Again, we're all sharing the same planet. And just see what happens. Does your hand detect any movement? Pulsing, rocking. Is there any temperature change? Is there any change in your breathing? Yeah. And when there's a breath or a gulp or a different emotion come up, then let your hand come down. And see how, <clears throat> how is that? Thank you, Betsy. So what happened for me is at some point I took a deeper breath. And you know what rushed into my heart? A lot of love for Rivka. Beautiful. That's the, that's... I, I think she was saying a bunch of stuff that was naturally I disagree with. But my God, I love her. I mean, I just saw a beautiful person. That's the beauty of connecting through the depth of what we are as human beings. Yeah. yeah. So thank you. Thank and you. I got... I, I got this kind of with the, the two fingers on the hard and the two fingers on the soft. I was like, oh, it's possible to hold on to both at once. Mm -hmm. I can have my heart, you know, I can have my adamantine opinions that I'm sure about and I can speak with force, but at the same time, I can have a, a felt connection to that connection to the person who's speaking and the fact that, you know what, we're just having a conversation at the same time, that, that ability to have a kind of both hemispheres going, that's a beautiful thing. Yeah, beautiful, Daniel. I, I love that, the, the two coming together, and that's what we're coming together. Yes. Because yeah. one you. without the other, you know, you, you lose something. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you, Betsy. Thank you, Betsy. Thank you. Shiranga. I'm not sure if I pronounce your name correctly. I see you with us. Do you yeah. need You do pronounce, pronounce it really well. Thank you. Hi, um, Gabor. Hello, Daniel. Um, I'm calling from Vancouver, Canada, and um, I'm finding it a little bit difficult in understanding the indoctrination um, of Israeli Zionists. I understand that they have been indoctrinated by birth. I have full empathy and compassion towards that. And um, I understand that the indoctrination has involved them hating um, the Palestinians and being convinced that they are there enemy for life. Um, but what I can't seem to fathom is how I have seen videos of Israeli content creators mocking their children and crying Palestinian mothers. There are social online groups that I have seen that poke fun at um, the videos that we have seen of just mutilated bodies yeah. and um, how the Palestinians are referred to as human animals. So. My question is, how did it get to this point? How did the moral ground of Zionists become so thin that it's almost non-existent? Because when we see such a fall in, in a certain race that is, that is happening right now, we have seen the videos, we can't unsee what we have seen. And such death and destruction should activate some kind of moral compass so I'm just having a little bit of difficulty understanding in why that hasn't happened in the majority of um, Israeli Zionists. Well, can, I ask you, can, can, I, can I ask you? Can I ask you a question, uh, uh, Shiranga? Are you from Sri Lanka, or where are you from? Because I see Ceylon in the background there. I am from Sri Lanka, and um, we you... have a very dark history of uh, the genocide of Tamils. So this has really ignited a lot yeah. of um, things within me. So, yeah. yeah. So what I'm saying is, so if you look at Sri Lanka and its history, or if you look at modern India, even right now, and the uh, anti-Muslim jingoism and hatred and violence that's being fomented and perpetrated by the actual government of India, Modi, and you should see the 
tremendous um, inter people violence and hatred that happened in that country as a legacy of British imperialism. So the massacres in India of Muslims or the massacres of Hindus by Muslims that occurred in during partition in uh, 1948 in India is paralleled by what the British Empire left in Palestine. This is the effect of empire. It turns people against each other and it dehumanizes other groups in the eyes of one group. And um, <clears throat> there's nothing special to me in that sense of what was happening in Israel, Palestine. So, yeah, it's horrendous to watch Israelis mock Palestinian suffering. Um, it's troubling to see sometimes Muslims celebrating Jewish suffering. Um, but in terms of how it can happen, that's a very human phenomenon, unfortunately. And it happens in the wake of oppression and imperialism and um, colonialism and the essence of empire, whether it was the Ottoman Empire or the British Empire or now the American Empire or the Roman Empire, is to dehumanize a whole lot of people. And unfortunately, the legacy is dehumanization. So that's what you're seeing there now. Uh, and a society where for 75 years, the Palestinian was just the enemy, but never human. But it's not unique. And we Jews are neither uniquely good or uniquely bad. It's just, unfortunately, a very human phenomenon that we see universally. That's my response. Thank you. Yeah, I would I would only add that <clears throat> it's easy to assume that it's hate that is motivating people, and there certainly are hateful people in Israel. It's usually the hateful people that are leading everyone else around. But not every German was hateful towards Jews. They were just indifferent, and they were exasperated, and they were over it, in a sense. They just couldn't anymore with these Jews. What are you going to do? So they turned a blind eye. Or they justified it, or they minimized it, and that's all you have to have people do. That's what you know the banal the banality of evil, right? So, actually, the, I'd say the main emotion of Israelis towards Palestinians over the years has not been hatred. And when we when we frame it like, oh, there's hatred on both sides, that misses the point. What there is is a complete and total ignorance and an inability to see them, and a desire for them to just fucking disappear already. When will they leave us alone? The word I heard from Israelis over and over again when I lived there was not shalom, sheket. Sorry, not shalom, peace. It was sheket, quiet. That's all they want, just some peace and quiet. When are they just going to leave us? Just please, enough already, enough, enough. It's denial. Now, when you deny another people, never mind their right to exist, but you deny their existence, now everything they do is an irritant to you. They're like flies that you have to swat. They're like cockroaches that you have to stomp. And that's the way Israeli leaders have spoken about Palestinians. And it resonates with Israelis because to Israelis, Palestinians have become the avatars for why they can't just live in peace and quiet. But peace and quiet is not peace. Peace and justice is peace. Exactly. And that's never been an option that's been sold to the Israeli public. Only peace and quiet, which will come with getting rid of the Palestinian problem or the Palestinian question. And now we start having reminiscent phrases that should remind us of our own history. So yeah, I would just say that the whole hate thing is a bit of a misleading idea. It's not necessarily about hate. It's about convincing yourself, you know what, there's nothing beautiful over there that we're bombing. There's no real peace. They're just enough already. We've, we've done everything we can with these people. And in some ways, that's more dangerous than hate is. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I would like to read one question which reflects on several questions. I have uh, important and visible roles in my Jewish community and feel I'm afraid to speak my truth for fear of losing my community. 
how to deal with dissonance, the fear of losing my community if I speak out. The unraveling of my Zionist indoctrination feels so painful and alienating. Well, so very quickly, um, <clears throat> that's an issue that I've been concerned with for a long time, not specifically to do with this issue, but in human life in general. And the question that's being asked is, how can I stay authentic and true to myself and still belong? And in the book that Dan and I wrote together, The Myth of Normal, we have a chapter on attachment versus authenticity. Attachment is a need to belong, to be accepted, to be loved, to be validated, to connect. That's one need that human beings have, especially as children. And then we have another need for authenticity to be ourselves, to be in touch with our gut feelings, to be with our hearts, to be able to manifest and express our own being and our way of seeing the world. And sometimes the two are not compatible. Sometimes a person has to choose. In order to belong, I have to suppress myself. Or in order to express myself, I have to face that I may not belong anymore, that some people will not accept me, will not love me, will reject me. And all I can say to people is, I can't tell you how to decide. You have to decide if the two are compatible. If you can go to your friends and your family and say, listen, I'm very sorry. I know this hurts you. This confuses you. This puzzles you. You don't get it. But I need to tell you how I feel. Would you please listen? And if they're capable of giving you the listening and still accept you, even though they completely disagree with you or might be totally upset by what you say, then you can have the attachment and you can have the authenticity. But if you can't, then you have a decision to make. Which pain would you rather have? And I can't make that decision for you. Nobody can. Would I rather have the pain of suppressing myself and denying my own truth? Or would I rather the pain of being rejected by people that I care for? But there may not be a pain-free option. So the only decision you might be able to make in that case is which pain would you rather have? I've made that decision a long time ago. The first time I spoke about this issue was in 1967, and I got kicked out of my father's house. But I've made that decision. No, we reconciled, and my father actually came around to see my view of it, to accept it. But I've made that decision at every point in my life. Because everything I've ever done in my medical work has been completely against the mainstream. And I've had to make a decision. Do I rather belong to the mainstream and you know, or do I expect my expect my truth? That doesn't make me right all the time. But it's just a decision that I've made. I'm gonna go for the authenticity whenever I can. And forget about who likes it and who doesn't. You got the same decision to make. I can't prescribe it for you. If you chose to suppress your truth, to belong, I would totally understand it. I would not judge you for it. Neither should you judge yourself. But just decide which pain would you rather have. Thank you. Thank you, Gabor. Uh, Daniel, I don't see you. I don't know if you have anything to add. No, I don't think Daniel needs to add to this one. He's uh, he, yeah. he helped me write that chapter. <laughs> the, the only thing I would add is this when my dad first started speaking out about this he had something to lose his father's approval standing in the medical community all kinds of stuff like that there's a lot of people who have things to lose by speaking out I'm in this uncancelable place I've, I've got no concerns so I can't advise any there are real material conditions to you know there's a great line from the wire that great HBO show you know where Butchie the blind bartender says conscience do cost conscience mm. do cost and that's really something to reckon with you know now lack of conscience also do cost it just costs a different kind of currency but yeah. it's a real question it's, and there's yeah no one can prescribe the answer I can answer one more question and then I've got a dinner reservation. Okay. So at the end of our time. 
Well, yes, do, you want, do you want to keep it going a bit longer or how do you feel about it? If the two it's of you are you. open, absolutely. I, I'll stay on for another half an hour if you guys want me to. Awesome. Okay. Daniel. Okay, go ahead. So let's take the next question so Daniel can be here for it. Daniel, you wanted to add anything? No, no you're it's done. That it takes okay. an extra question. So All right. ask. I'll take one more question and then I'll say goodbye. Mm -hmm. As much as I'd love to stay. I would like to see if Maurice Jacobson is here. Maurice, are you around? I just tried to contact you. Maurice? Maurice, I'm still on mute. No, I guess he's not. Okay. Oh, on mute. I'm here. Okay, we can, can hear you. me. I um I'm oh. on a computer oh. uh traveling that doesn't have a camera. So I'm sorry I can't uh, be seeing. We hear you loud and clear. Okay. Well, my perspective that I would like to, you know, throw out to this mix is that to me, I think what we're seeing in the Middle East in Israel is a classic case of the abused becoming an abuser. And after traveling extensively and living in both um, Israel and inside the Gaza Strip. What I've heard over and over again in Israel is a real paranoia um, of we have to get them before they get us. Mm -hmm. But in the Palestinian community, especially from the young men, um, who I'm sure were the young men who entered into Israel were the lines, I'd rather die fighting than die a slow death. Mm -hmm. And my impression, sadly, is that almost all of those young people going into Israel were going in for revenge, that every one of them, I'm sure, lost a family member, lost a loved one. They might have lost their wives. They might have lost their children. And I don't think it was ideological. I think it was primarily anger. And so I think a lot of people who look at the situation in Gaza today um, are angry. We're really angry that the situation got to be where it is. And you two have articulated it to a certain point that there's a 14-year-old history and that history did not begin on October 7th. But, well, there really, there's a 100-year-old history, but yes, let me take your point. Um, the point is that I'm hoping through whatever work that I can do and whatever work that other people out there who are listening to this are angry can challenge that anger into positive action is not just bemoan the fact that we're in a terrible situation, but do things positively to through mass media, through social media, through um, lobbying, through um, protests, through boycott, in any way they can to try to change the situation. Um, we can't just passively sit and bemoan this situation. So dealing with grief and dealing with anger is through taking positive action on yourself. So I'd love yeah. to uh, see how you what your reaction is to that. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll just say quickly before I have to sign off, amen and inshallah, like, yes, that that is exactly what needs to happen. I have nothing to add to what you said, because everything you said is, I think, very accurate. I would just note for the people listening that we had a gentleman your name is Maurice Jacobson, is that right? Right. Sounds like a rather Hebraic name, an Ashkenazi name. It is. I've done Aliyah. I hold dual citizenship. Oh, hold dual citizenship. Okay. So just, just for the people listening, let's just note that we have a Jewish citizen of Israel, born in the United States, right, who has spent time where in the Gaza Strip? I was... Oh, you, go ahead. Yeah, I, I, I'm. Yeah, I'm just. I'm just highlighting something for people listening because I think it's really worth noting. Because one of the talking points you hear is, "Oh, okay, Mates, you're such a Palestinian ally. Why don't you go live in Gaza and see how they treat you? See how they treat Jews? You know." 
And the fact is, when I asked my dad and my brother, who have both spent time in the occupied territories, did you ever feel threatened or endangered because you're a Jew? My dad said, yeah, by Israeli soldiers. Well, that's exactly the way I felt that's as well. So After just, all the time I I've lived there. Hold on, Maurice, Maurice. I just want to encourage people who are listening, to whom that might be a surprising fact, don't let it slide by. Let it sink in. Maybe there's something you haven't heard or something you have heard that's not true. And I think you're absolutely right that when you have people without a past, present, or a future, and people who are desperate and angry and full of desire for revenge, then the actions of October 7th, as barbaric or brutal as they may seem, become a lot less surprising and start to seem even inevitable, which is not to justify them, but it is to think intelligently if, that is, we don't want it to happen again. And I certainly don't want it to happen again. Um, with that, I got to I gotta go and have uh, a meal here. So thank you for having me. And, and if we do this again, that would be a welcome thing for me. Thank, thank you so that. much. Thank you, that, yeah. thank you. Really appreciate your presence. Talk soon. Thank you. Enjoy your dinner. Bye. Gabor, I would like Darren. Darren, are you with us? Ask you to unmute. Yes. Hi. Well, I said white peas. Oh. Sarah, can we bring Darren? Darren, would you like to start your video? We can spotlight Darren even without video. Actually, that's yeah. not possible. Darren, would you like I, to start your video? Um, I can't come on video because I'm driving. I'm gonna pull over. I'm in the process of pulling over right now. Okay. Um, hi, so good to see. You. Oh, we're not hearing you well. You you're breaking the run. Zaya, do you want to take somebody else while she gets organized? Okay. Yeah, I'll I'll work on it. It's okay. Let's bring Daniel. Daniel Vilka. Vilka. Hi there. Hi. Um, thank you for the platform, Sands and uh, Sand, and, uh, and to Gabor and Daniel for for being here. Um, I'm, I'm in Ecuador, actually, and Vilcabamba is a little town in the south of Ecuador in the Andes Mountains. Um, you know, the the topic of this conversation is navigating difficult uh, conversations, and um, and it strikes me that that you know, as we know, I think all of us. And certainly, as uh, as Dr. Mate professes, uh, you know, emotions beget physiological uh, issues and change that that cause us disease and, and illness. And my strategy, and I wanted to get your opinion on this, Dr. Mate, um, is, is to rise above the conversation. And and when I'm in conversation with people who have a strong opinion. I appeal to their their sense of of humanity, basically, of their sense of justice, and of course, you know, it helps a lot if people have context and and understand context. So I encourage also that they that they look at other sources for their information than the traditional sources that they look at, and and I try to lift them away from uh, uh, the, the 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 narrative that they're embedded in, and. This kind of thing um, works in, in many different situations. It worked. It worked in, in for COVID as well. You know, very divisive um, conversations, um, and this is a very divisive conversation. So, just your opinion on, on trying to lift it out of the emotional content and uh, and into a better place that people can see see the forest for the trees, as it were. Well, Daniel, if you can do that, uh, congratulations. Um... As you can see, even today, never mind lifting other people above their emotions, it's hard for me to even rise above my emotions. Now, that's part of my history, you know. For some reason, this issue really burns at the very core of my heart. So I can't pretend to do something that I, I'm just not enlightened enough to do. I just have to work hard to try and stay as calm and, and 
rational as I possibly can be. In terms of presenting history to other people, my God, I have dozens, hundreds of Israeli and Jewish sources that I could share with people about the history going back to the last 150 years, the last 75 years, the last decades of what ha what's happening there. People aren't interested. When they're in an emotional position, they're just not interested in looking at that history. And um, so I appreciate the intent of what you're talking about. And if you've got the inner resources and can enlist the listening of the people that you're talking to, more power to you. For me, I just need to struggle with what I see, what I know, the false narratives that have, are, are dominating the conversation in the North American media, the, to my, in my view, the trauma derived narrowness of the mainstream Jewish communities and to try and maintain some presence in the face of all that. That's all I can do. And sometimes I succeed and sometimes I don't succeed as may you have, as you may you have, as you may have witnessed today. So thank you. More power to you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you I want to read uh, one uh, question, basically. I'm longing to hear the Mates address the war machine that continues to make money on violence everywhere in the world. If there were no money to make, there would be no war. There would be negotiation and debates and dialogues until people really grasp this reality. The war will continue. So look, um, what we have here is a world empire system. Um, that's been going on for hundreds of years. There was the British Empire on which the sun never set. And the British Empire wasn't just created for the sake of war. War was created for the sake of the empire, to keep the empire in power. So the British went to Asia, massacred hundreds of thousands of people. They went to Africa, killed many, many people. The Belgians killed 12 million or 10 million people in the Congo. The French killed multiple hundreds of Arabs in North Africa. Then the British and the French between them, um, invaded and divided between them, the Middle East, Egypt, Palestine, Syria, Lebanon, what is now Saudi Arabia, Jordan, that whole area. They tried to control Iran. The Americans killed 3 million Vietnamese. 3 million. Half a million Iraqis. 300,000 Afghanis, tens of thousands in Libya, and we see what's happening in Palestine. And it's for the sake of power and control and profit. War is essential. War machinery is essential. Most of the aid that goes to the Ukraine, for example, doesn't go to the Ukraine. It goes to American war uh, industries. Much of the aid that goes to Israel doesn't go to Israel. It goes to American war manufacturing companies, arms manufacturers. But it's not the war machinery that's driving. It's contributing to it, but it's not the fundamental um, dynamic. The fundamental dynamic is domination of the world of which war is an essential um, but it's an essential necessity is what it is to keep it going and as soon as one war or one enemy goes they're already beating the drum 
The drums are already beating for the war with China. The drums are already beating. Somebody was, the last speaker was from Ecuador. Let's look at the history of Ecuador. How many tens of thousands of people were massacred in Ecuador to maintain the glory of the American empire? Not that long ago. The world has forgotten it. So we have a world system here that's bent on domination. War is essential to its project. And Israel and Palestine, horrible as it is, are like little fish compared to the big sharks that are really controlling the tank. That's how I see it. Thank you. And just to feed on that, there are a couple of questions that say, and how does that feed on our trauma, on intergenerational trauma, on unconscious? Well, the essence of trauma is fear. And the politicians use fear. They exploit people's fear. And as Noam Chomsky said, there's nothing is easier than to make the American public afraid. So there's always enemies. There's always a war on something. There's a war on drugs. There's a war on terrorism. There's a war on communism. Um, so the empire needs enemies and it needs fear to fuel the public support for its projects. And in a society where there's a lot of trauma, there's nothing more easy than to uh, uh, trigger people's fears. And just to continue on that, few questions about safety and security. We all need safety to feel safe. And at the same time, is there is also a false quest for safety or security that we're seeing? And um... Well, I, I'll give you one quick example. So there's this film made by Jewish, young Jewish Americans called Israelism, Israelism. It's about their own um, education and, 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 and um, rearing in a pro-Israel, pro-Zionist environment. Their disillusionment from that perspective by finding out the broader perspective on it. And it's been seen by a lot of people. It was seen here in Vancouver recently. You can watch it online, Israelism. Now, when people, when certain campuses invited the Jewish filmmakers, <laughs> when Jewish students on American campuses invited the Jewish filmmakers to show this film about Jews, some people said, oh, we don't feel safe. What they're really saying is, we don't feel comfortable. There's a huge difference between feeling safe and feeling comfortable. Wow. There's nothing threatening to anybody. Nobody's going to get beat up, fired, hit, killed, abused, because Jewish filmmakers invited by Jewish students to show a Jewish film on a campus. There was no threat to anybody. There was discomfort. And in today's world, we often say, I don't feel safe. Well... No, you don't feel comfortable. The two are not the same thing. Yeah. And that, how does that connect to the right to defend itself? Israel, America, that feeds back to the war machine as well on that level. Well, look, the Vietnam War was fought in America's right to defend itself. Because the idea was if the Vietnamese win back their own country from American control, that would, the dominoes would start falling and then, you know, Indonesia would be next and, you know, the domino theory. When Hitler launched his wars, he did it in the name of German safety. We don't want war, we want peace. We're just being, you know, threatened. Israel does have a right to defend itself. Every country has a right to defend itself. But against who? On October the 7th, and we've said this, my sons and I have said this, Israel had the right to defend itself. Its territory was invaded. Its people were being killed. Some of them were captured. 
Israel had the right to defend itself on that day. It couldn't stand by um, uh, silently and passively and watch its people being killed. Nobody's arguing that. But for the most part, when we talk about Israel's right to defend itself, we're talking about defending itself against the people resisting the brutal occupation of their own, own lands. In the West Bank, Israel has no right to defend itself. In Gaza, Israel has not no right to defend itself. In Israel, Israel has a right to defend itself. But who is it defending itself against? When they go into refugee camps in the West Bank and they kill 12 people, men, women, children, they don't care. When they capture, since October the 7th, they've taken 7,000 prisoners in the West Bank, 7,000 hostages. I'm getting heated again. And killed 400 people in the West Bank. And hundreds of people have been killed. Children have been killed. Who is it defending itself against? Against the people that it's occupying. So let's make a distinction between a country's right to defend its borders and a country's right to occupy, suppress, oppress, kill, torture, dispossess other people. And the two are often confused. Okay, so Duran, Duran, um, yeah. we can bring, let's try to bring Duran on, otherwise we have her question as well. And this would be the last question we take. Okay. Can I start now? Can yes. you all hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, so I um, am a retired military officer and Air Force social worker who was a conscientious objector uh, while serving in the Iraqi war. And I felt really ashamed at that time to be an American citizen, someone from the United States of America, while watching babies die, innocent babies die uh, when I was there. But I can't help but to also see that this these wars uh, you know, are constantly reminders of white supremacy culture, that black and brown bodies are viewed as less than all around the world. And for that, as the, as the founder of Black Therapist Rock, what I'm experiencing is a lot of black and brown people saying, you know, this feels like the same of what we've always experienced. So how do we prevent those who are systemically marginalized? How do we help them navigate compassion fatigue and um, vicarious trauma at this time? Well, I don't think the trauma is vicarious. I think um, there's been an interesting phenomenon recently. It's been going on for quite a while, actually, but it's been um, heightened recently. There were, it's true, a lot of Jews involved in the civil rights movement in the States. That's true. And now... Jews are saying, well, we've stood with you in your civil rights struggle. Why don't you stand with us when it comes to defending Israel? And I think the answer is, is that what a lot of people of color and marginalized people in the States are feeling is not vicarious trauma. They're feeling their own trauma that they suffered for a long time being mirrored in what's happening in Palestine. So in that trauma, in that sense, the trauma is not vicarious. It's actually black American trauma has not been healed yet. In fact, it's exacerbated every day by the system. And we can see that in the health status of, uh, of, of, of minority people in the States. We can see that black children are much more likely to die at birth than white children, incidentally. If they're delivered by black doctors, their death rate is half as much. And if they're delivered by white doctors, whereas the death rate of white children, infants is not affected by the race of the physician. And I could go on and on and on, and we write about this in our book, The Myth of Normal. But what I'm saying is that the trauma of 
And if you look at who goes into the military in the United States and who gets PTSD, oh. it's the people who are poor and marginalized. So they find in the military some kind of a possibility of a career. Then they get sent overseas and they endure all these terrific, uh, uh, terrible experiences. So what I'm saying is that the trauma that you're describing here is not vicarious. It's a mirroring of the trauma that people in the states, particularly minority people, people of color, have historically endured. And that's why a lot of American black people automatically and almost intuitively identify with the Palestinian people these days because they get it. Thank you, Duran. Do you have anything to say? Is it? No, I just really appreciate Gabor giving words to that so eloquently. Um, it's it's been really challenging to you know try to hold space for all of our clients, regardless of their identities, and also take care of ourselves. For me to take care of me, um, it's been very challenging during these days, and just a lot of grief. Um, that's what I've been experiencing, a lot of pain in my heart around what seems like the world falling apart has always, you know, often frequently felt like the world has been falling apart. And so to say, yes, it's a mirroring of the trauma that lives in me, that feels a a accurate. Thank you. Thank you, Duran. Thank you so much. Gabor, should we bring Betsy before we close the meeting? Yeah. Sure, please. Betsy, yes. Okay, so what's happening with your breathing? Are you breathing? Because with the anxiety, pain, sadness, our breath gets affected. How can it not? So often shallow or limited. So watch your breath. Again, no need to change it or fix it. Just watch. And more specifically, right now, watch the speed. Has your breath sped up or slowed down? And stay with that. Just watch. And of course, allow change if it happens. And next, watch the movement. Where is there movement inside you? Where does your breath hit the wall? When it hits a wall, what happens? What are the shape changes inside? As you breathe, changes happen inside. Shape changes. And as you watch your breath, it has the potential to ripple, bounce off those walls and move somewhere it hasn't been before. And again, your support, your contact to the ground. And as your breath is coming in and out, perhaps there's a little more room inside to hold whatever's there. And again, we're not trying to change anything, anybody's ideas, but is there more room inside to hold whatever's there? Or perhaps take the edge off your breath, more space. I call it space medicine. Not getting rid of anything, but hold the pain with more of me. And that allows you to not dysregulate one part quite so much.
and watch your breath. Thank you. Back to Gabor. Thank you, Betsy. Thank you so much. And thank you, Gabor, for so for stay the extra half an hour to hold this conversation. It's such a honor and a gift. And thank you, each and every one, for being here in this difficult conversation and all it. So and sorry we couldn't address all the questions, but we hope to continue this conversation with Gabor and other speakers to create this space to continue to grow and learn and learn how to be uncomfortable together. That's a practice we haven't. Yeah. We don't chance. develop we much. We don't develop that skill. Especially in the US. Yeah. In the Western world. Thank you, Gabor. Thank you for being here with us. Thank you to the SEN team for holding the space for this. Stacy, Lisa, Sarah, sure. Carlos, Jean-Ric, thank you so much. And until we meet again, we'll be sending the recording to everyone. Feel free to share it. And also the list of resources. We will receive an email with all the resources mentioned.